If you were in a plane flying southwest from India to southern Africa and you looked down about halfway, you might be lucky enough to see this beautiful little spot, the island of Picabar. It's only 10 kilometers long and dominated at its northern end by these two dramatic volcanic peaks. Their slopes are covered in dense rainforest, within which there exists an extraordinary range of plants and animals found only on Picabar. Over 600 endemic species have been discovered so far. Like many island ecosystems, however, Picabar is now under threat. Virtually uninhabited until 50 years ago, an ever-increasing human presence is causing considerable habitat degradation. Over 70 species are now thought to be extinct. Picabar's situation has attracted a lot of attention from conservation scientists, and they have recently designated a number of 25 species as being under the greatest level of threat. Amongst the amphibians, the flagship species is the very colourful Picabar tree frog, an insectivore that lives high up in the trees of the mid-altitude forests. Its numbers started declining about a decade ago, and it's now estimated that the species is found across less than 10% of its previously known range. Several groups are working on ways to reverse this loss, leading to, for example, the establishment of the Picabar tree frog reintroduction centre on the island. Now, managing the decline of any species is usually made easier if one understands what is causing the decline. Unfortunately, for the Picabar tree frog, this is an area of uncertainty. Two hypotheses have been put forward. The first proposes that it is due to the introduction of a known predator of frogs in India, the rat snake, which was first noticed on Picabar about a decade ago. No one, however, has yet recorded a rat snake, or any other predator for that matter, actually eating a Picabar tree frog. But this could be considered unexceptional, given how hard it is to observe the frogs in the forest canopy. The second hypothesis proposes that the decline is due to the decreasing availability of an insect that is a known diet item of the Picabar tree frog, the Picabar lady beetle. Its own population has been decimated again over the last decade by a fungal pathogen. So, in the research that I will now report, we look for further evidence that might help us answer this question. Is the decline of the Picabar tree frog due to increased predation by rat snakes or the decreased availability of a critical diet item, the Picabar lady beetle? So, how do we go about this? Well, starting with the snakes, a seemingly less complicated matter. If it is increased predation, then in the forest, rat snakes must eat these frogs. And in captivity, one would predict they would also eat them. But again, this has not yet been studied. So we ask this simple question, do they? We set up 20 perspex chambers, each with a single snake in a bimodal temperature regime, as preferred by rat snakes. These snakes were starved for a month. After which, six frogs were placed in each chamber, three Picabar tree frogs and three brown frogs, which are about the same size and are a known prey item of the rat snake. The snakes quickly ate all the brown frogs, but even after a week, none of the Picabar tree frogs 
had been eaten. We did record some occasional attacks on the tree frogs, but the snakes quickly spat them out again. So our first question seemed to have a fairly clear answer. No. Turning to the beetles now, it seems a less obvious, obvious option, because if their decline is the cause, then the frogs must depend on this one species as a source of food, which is unusual for a frog, and especially so considering that the frog's habitat supports over 1,400 species of insects, many of which would appear to be suitable as a food source. Also, to demonstrate a nutritional dependence of this kind is difficult experimentally, especially in the artificial environments that we use. One can, however, use a proxy for dependence because one would predict that tree frogs dependent on these beetles would also prefer them very strongly over other insects from their, from their habitat. So that's the experimental question that we asked. We set up another series of 20 chambers, each with a single tree frog, and after a week's starvation, 10 lady beetles were introduced into the chamber, along with 10 insects each of four other species found in the frog's habitat. The frogs were observed to eat the lady beetles, and preferentially, but they also ate reasonably large numbers of the other insects, including up to 50% in the case of the jasmine mayfly on the right. Now, most ecologists would not interpret this pattern as being one of strong preference. I would say this is a case of moderate preference and as such, it is not consistent with the idea that the frog depends on the lady beetle as a food source. So, this was not good. Our evidence so far was not supporting either proposal. What to do? Well, we started looking to the literature and talking to our colleagues. And this led us to a very interesting case from the forests of South America. You may have heard of the poison dart frogs, from which the native people extract a deadly neurological poison called patracotoxin that they use on their arrows and darts for hunting and warfare. Recent scientific evidence suggests that this toxin, which is proposed as a means to deter predation of the frogs, is derived from the consumption of certain beetles of the Mellorid genus. Frogs raised in captivity on a diet free of Mellorid beetles lack the toxin that is present in the frogs of the forest. So we wondered if a similar interrelationship might exist on Picabar. And we were forced also to question the design of our original experiment. The tree frogs that had been presented to the rat snakes had been raised on a diet rich in lady beetles because they're being raised in large numbers at our nearby Picaba lady beetle reintroduction centre. So, now we went back and we set up our final experiment to address this question here. In the first stage, tree frogs were raised for a month on one of five diets, three of which are shown here, in which the percentage of lady beetles offered to the frogs vis-a-vis -vis other insects varied from 100% down to zero. Then, into each of these chambers, a rat snake was introduced for a week, after which we counted the number of frogs eaten. As this chart shows, 
Once the percentage of beetles in the diet dropped below 50%, the rat snakes started eating some of the frogs, and they ate more of them as the percentage dropped further. So, what does this all mean? Well, this was our original question, based on our assumption of a simple and or type of situation. It seems, however, that it's a little bit, a little bit more subtle. First, perhaps the strongest indication we have is that the decline of the beetle population is not the whole story. Even if lady beetles disappeared altogether, our results support the idea that the frogs would still be able to acquire adequate nutrition from other insects. But our results do fit well with the idea that, as for poison dart frogs, a beetle-poor diet might somehow make frogs more vulnerable to, or more attractive to, predators. And they also open the door for the idea that the frogs might now also be increasingly vulnerable not just to rat snakes, but to other predators who can now exploit the changed conditions. In terms of a model for further research, we think that the original model is misleading in that by framing the interactions within a food pyramid, it positions the lady beetle as a simple nutrient source. In our new model, we propose that the lady beetle is in fact a source of some chemical that makes frogs unpalatable, and that the lack of this factor in recent times has led to increased predation perhaps by rat snakes, and perhaps by other animals on Picabar, in particular the late arriving kingfisher. This model is, of course, highly speculative, but many of its predictions are readily testable. For example, we are already studying captive frogs raised on different diets, as per our third experiment, and analysing them, analyzing them chemically for candidate deterrence factors. I want to finish by returning to the question of management. Despite the science, the science having a long way to go, given the urgency of the tree frog's situation, we recommend the following. There is already a program underway to breed fungal resistant lady beetles. We now suggest that the tree frog program should assist it with finances and other resources. The removal of rat snakes, which are a pest in any case, should be given even higher priority. And finally, we encourage the bird ecologists on Picabar to focus some of their attention on any predatory bird species that are visitors to the canopies of the mid-altitude forests. We can only hope now that one day further research and sensible management will return the Picabar tree frog to its rightful place on the mountain slopes. In any case, this study reminds us to approach any project with an open mind. While we should begin our journeys in the hope that the route will be straight and simple, we should always be ready for when it evolves into a more challenging and more intriguing jungle track. Thank you for your attention.